I think there are some cultural lessons and some sort of symbolic anthropology or some interpretive lessons to be learned here. I'm not going to go fully Bruno Latour on you and tell you that SARS doesn't exist because it's just an idea or something. But we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the sort of cultural anthropology of SARS. SARS is a syndrome. Severe acute respiratory syndrome just means you're having a whole lot of trouble breathing. You're having severely acute trouble breathing, right? That syndrome is caused by a virus. That virus happens to be called SARS-CoV, which is short for SARS coronavirus. Who here speaks Spanish? What's a corona? It is a it is a crown. Yes. Like a halo, a crown, yeah. If you look at SARS under a microscope, it sort of looks like it has this fuzzy halo all around it. It's very, very unique. We talked about HIV as a virus having those little spiky balls projecting off it, right? SARS has far more of those with little feelers on the end of them. They almost look like a big furry sort of ring around it. So it has this really unique, almost like a glowing kind of appearance under a microscope. It is a corona virus. Are there any others in the world? Uh, there are a few super obscure ones, but really, the coronaviruses are pretty unique. There's SARS, and then there's its friend, on it, MERS. The Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is also caused by a coronavirus. Those are at the moment are the, really the only two important ones. So how do we get SARS? Well, we think that it is zoonotic. In other words, that it comes from animals, non-human reservoir. Uh, not a ton of research on this. SARS is pretty new, right? And not a ton of people in history have had it. It's tough to say exactly, but we're pretty sure bats. Bats are also looking sort of likely as a cause for MERS. Some conflicting research on that and some compelling research on that. But we suspect that maybe bats are where we get SARS. How do you catch it? Well, it's airborne, transmitted through droplets. Generally, you need to have pretty close contact in order to get SARS, although that contact can be casual. So if somebody was standing next to you and coughing, then that may well be close enough to catch SARS. So, um, main symptoms, uh, again, you pitch up an immune response, so your body gets really hot. You develop a fever. Why do we get fevers? To try and kill the bad stuff. Yeah, the same reason that we boil our syringes. To try and cook out the bad stuff. So your body pitches up a fever, it pitches up an inflammatory response, right, that generally induces respiratory failure. This is why we worry about SARS. At some point you stop being able to breathe. Okay? In terms of mortality rates, something on the order of 1 in 10. 10% okay? of people that are infected with SARS on average die. That's the aggregate rate. However, Huge difference in age groups, okay? So mortality from SARS among older people is much higher. I like to think of SARS as basically being influenza with a passport and an airplane ticket. And we'll talk about why in a moment. It behaves in a fairly similar way. It's also viral, it's transmitted in a similar way, and it causes similar symptoms with a similar mortality profile. Why we're interested in it, and with regards to the reading that we did, I think it can teach us some neat things about the city of Toronto, Ontario. Did you guys know globally that SARS was a major hotspot here in Toronto? We were one of the highest rates worldwide. Us in sort of Hong Kong, a couple of cities in China. Toronto was actually globally in the hot seat. <laughs> the article that we read was written by Andrew Galley. Do we remember that one? Andrew Galley's main argument is this. You want to think about SARS, never mind looking at it under a microscope. It's not half as dangerous as a lot of other diseases. It occurred late in our response to disease, right? SARS is post-HIV, it's post-smallpox. By the time SARS came along, it was already the 2000s. And we had a lot of sensible public health measures. We had the internet, we had hand sanitizer. We had all sorts of stuff to protect us. And as it was, we responded pretty well. SARS could have been awful and it wasn't. People died, but not nearly as many as could have, should have. So, Galley says, you want to think about SARS, think about it as a symbol. Toronto likes to believe that it's a global city, right? We are so multicultural. You can get all kinds of food here. There are so many immigrants here, right? We are proud of that. We aspire to that. And in fact, these days, being international is something a city is supposed to want, right? We should aspire to being globalized. That's prestigious. It's exciting much better than the opposite, hey, which is being insular, provincial, 
We are not. We're extroverted. We are global. However, he says, that comes with this kind of fear. It comes with an anxiety. We desperately want to be global, but we fear what is out there in the world. And every once in a while, the world comes home to visit us in scary ways. Being global, having an airport that's as busy as Pearson, means that SARS is going to arrive. It just will. At the center of that article that Galley writes, and I'd encourage you to take another quick crack at it, even if you struggled with it, is this idea of a tension between our desire to be global, to be modern, to be cosmopolitan, and our fear of what that might mean. The tension between the risk and the reward between the local and the global. And in order to explore that tension, he uses a theorist named Mary Douglas. Here's what Mary Douglas said about human nature. Mary Douglas says, here's how it works. Human beings understand the world around them by dividing it into binary categories. Let me give you an example. There are two kinds of things in the universe. All right, Exactly two kinds of things. There are things that belong on the floor and things that don't. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So, the lid to my coffee cup belongs on the table or on the cup or in the garbage or something. Does it belong on the floor? It does not. Is this floor clean right now? It is, relatively speaking. Is it clean now? It's not. Why not? Because there's garbage on the floor. What made it garbage? Because it doesn't belong there. This is important, right? This is super important. Think about what you just said. There's garbage on the floor. Was there garbage on the table? There was not. Same object, what happened? Went into the wrong category. Because there are two kinds of things in the universe. There's things that belong on the floor and things that don't. Douglas said this is how humans perceive the universe. We make categories about stuff, right? And this insight is so powerful, so profound. Things that belong on the floor, things that don't, that's pretty straightforward. I think we all understand it. Douglas said this whole idea that we have about what is pure, it's nothing to do with hygiene, nothing to do with bacteria. It's about matter being in the wrong place. If there are leaves lying on the grass outside your window, everything is fine. If those leaves blow into the window and land on the rug, your rug is now dirty. Right? Because that matter is in the wrong place. It's out of place. That is what purity is about. Right? So, things that belong on the floor and things that don't, that's easy. That's straightforward. What if we started making categories like things that are male and things that are female? things that are alive and things that are dead. Now we start getting complicated, right? And generally speaking, in human societies, when you put on your ethnographer cap and you go off to a faraway place and live with an exotic group of people, where you see people transgressing boundaries, they have power. So the title of Douglas's most successful book in which she lays out all of these problems is purity and danger. But imagine somebody that transgresses the borders about things like local and foreign, in the case of Toronto. Healthy and sick. These categories are especially scary to us. And so it is that in so many tribes on Earth, when you go and find who are the powerful people, like the, the medicine men, the shaman, the spirit communicators, they will often be people, for instance, who cross-dress. Why? So that they can walk across that boundary more easily. Assume some power, some danger. This is Galley's argument about Toronto. Some of us have heard of the rites of passage, ways of moving you from one category to the next. Think about that in terms of Mary Douglas. Let's say that we have two categories in the world. How about children versus adults? <laughs> Can't be both, right? Are there any adults in the room? Three of you, great. So, you can't be both at the same time, and it's very dangerous to be neither, right? So, in so many cultures on Earth, when you want to change from being a child to an adult, 
you want to switch categories because all human life is just a whole bunch of rooms, right? And you can be in one or the other, but walking down that corridor is very dangerous. So we create our rites of passage in order to safely move you from one category to the next. The theorist who sort of came up with this idea is named Armin van Gennep. Great guy. I think he and Douglas read very well together. And sure enough, he said, go to a, a, a quinceañera, right? Hispanic families who have these great big sort of 15th birthday parties for girls. Because you're no longer a kid. Now you're an adult. And in order for you to safely become an adult, we have to have a big party. A bar mitzvah, right? A bat mitzvah. All sorts of cultures have these sort of traditions in which you come of age and in which we take you from that one category, we put you into the middle for a minute, and most societies have this, actually. A bizarro sort of liminal phase where you're in the dangerous in-between. You have to wear weird clothes. Sometimes you physically have to move over to somewhere else. And then we reintroduce you into your new status, and you're a completely different person. You're in the new box now, and you can't go back. So Galley's point about Mary Douglas and SARS is that Toronto is currently experiencing this bizarre big city anxiety about what it means to be local and global. What it means to be from Toronto versus to be from somewhere else. We're globalized, he says. China's already in Toronto. Toronto's already in China. Those distinctions are almost totally irrelevant now, right? In the days of air travel and Skype and stuff, but our Stone Age brains have a hard time getting around that concept. And we worry a lot about the danger that's out there. Right. We want Toronto to be pure, to have a little wall around it. That's why SARS was so hard for Toronto. We like to think of ourselves as being immune from that stuff, and we're not. It makes us feel weird about where we sit in the world. Toronto should be the kind of place where that doesn't happen. We want desperately to be global, and yet we sort of don't.